A milestone in the revival of the Austrian school came in 1974 when Hayek received the Nobel Prize in economics. No longer could the economics profession dismiss the Austrians out of hand. Now they would need, however grudgingly, to read Hayek's work or at least learn about it. In the intervening years, it's safe to say that Hayek's reputation has been secured. Some of his insights have even become commonplace. The nature of law and its role in the development of the entrepreneurial market process and how legislation impedes the market process are two of these. To commemorate his achievements and build on his foundation, we offer the F.A. Hayek Memorial Lecture. We are delighted to have Mr. Toby Baxendale deliver this year's Hayek Memorial Lecture. Mr. Baxendale is the founder of Bill Fields Food Company Limited. Established in 1992, Bill Fields supplies most of the upscale London and Southeast hotels and restaurants exclusively with their meat, poultry, game, and deli items. Additionally, he owns Direct Seafoods and Dry Stores Direct, which sells select spices and oriental products. Mr. Baxendale earned his B.S. with honors in economics from the London School of Economics. In October of 2001, he presented a series of lectures on entrepreneurship and Austrian economics to the European School of Management Economy 21st Century course at Oxford. In 2002, he funded the Distinguished Hayek Visiting Fellowship at the London School of Economics. Professor Roger Garrison gave the inaugural Hayek Memorial Lectures on his book, Time and Money. Mr. Baxendale will speak on the topic, Law versus Legislation, a Hayekian Entrepreneur in London. Oh, well, thank you, Professor Harbner, for your kind words there. Um, I suppose Lou, Lou has very kindly invited me uh, to come here in my capacity as an entrepreneur who's also got some uh, connection um, with, with the Austrian school. And one of the uh, great pleasures of, uh, of coming here, because we're, we all tend to be fairly off-piste speak, uh, thinkers, we're not part of the mainstream here, is everyone's got a little interesting story as to how they've uh, come to find um, the Austrian school. And um, I'll start really with, uh, with, with my first entrepreneurial um, activities and then come to how I found the Austrian school and what insights I have as an entrepreneur and a businessman to, uh, as to why the Austrian school is the correct school of, uh, of economic um, thought. So anyway, the start, if you imagine the 19, in the 1980s, there was a great um, polarization in, in politics. Um, I'm sure it was, it was the same over, over here as well. You had, you had Ronald Reagan uh, trying to roll back the frontiers of, uh, of, of the state and to break the um, sort of uh, social democrat um, consensus that existed in, in, in the UK we had Margaret Thatcher and she, she was elected on the platform of, um, of smashing the trade unions who were effectively ruling, ruling the country and establishing freedom of contract as a, as, as a right rather than monopoly union privileges um, as, as, the, as the central core thing that was driving the economy so it's a, it's a great time to be uh, just becoming politically aware and um, I, I, was, I, I was absolutely um, enthralled by Margaret Thatcher's appeal to the enterprise economy. And at age 13, when I was at um, boarding school, I, my first entrepreneurial insight was to I set up an insurance um, company. What, what, used to, what used to happen, and uh, <laughs> what, what, used to, what used to happen is if you got caught smoking or drinking or uh, doing any other kind of activity that was banned by the school authorities. You used to, they, they were very generous with you. I was at a Quaker school. They used to, used to just have to pay a fine first time around. They wouldn't tell your parents. So uh, what I did is I insured everyone. I insured, I insured, I insured everyone against their, getting their fines. So I, I, I would take their money and then pay out, you know, in the eventuality. I'd take a few pounds and then, then pay out the big fine, you know, when they, when, when, when they got caught. But the problem was, my, my business, I think it lasted 10 days. It, it might have been, it might have been, it might, it might, it might have been 12 days, but the, we, we all went on a school trip to um, Cambridge. We were about 12 miles away from Cambridge, the school, the school was, and um, got completely and utterly wrecked and drunk, uh, punting, on the, uh, punting on the river, river cam. And then went back to, went back to the, um, went back to the minibus to be taken back to, 
back to school and of course we were, we were all busted and that, that, was it, that, that, that was it at that point in time. So I was required to pay out, you know. And, I'm, and I, I'm, unfortunately, though, I'd spent all the money, you know. <laughs> time, so so that, that was my first business venture. And, it, and unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, it was a failure. Um, and and on, on, a, on a side point, a very interesting side point, being a Quaker school, I actually got the restitution was being, was being beaten up by the uh, by, by my fellow Quaker students there. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, not I wasn't um, I wasn't disin I wasn't uh, off put by um, my, my little capitalist uh, ventures. You know, I, I thought well, you know, we'll uh, we'll put them on the back burner now and maybe concentrate a bit more on studying. And um, off off I off I went to um, uh, the London. Uh, where, where did I go to? Um, Hammersmith, Hammersmith, Hammersmith and West London International College, which was, um, which was a, a very highly um, um, regarded college in uh, West London, but it was um, a hotbed of left-wing activity. And um, I set up a branch of the Federation of Conservative Students there. I thought that would be the, sen- you know, the sensible thing to do. And we, we were really quite radical. There were four of us um, <laughs> against the 2000... Uh, 2,000 assorted uh, lefties of various descriptions and uh, we used to o- organise uh, speaker meetings but we could, ne- we could never really hold them because when you've got that weight and body of um, you know, left-wing resistance you, 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 you we were kind of just being pushed off campus all the time so I used to hold my meetings at the Polish War Centre in Hammersmith <laughs> and uh, they were a very sound bunch of people they were all former uh, RAF pilots who'd, wor- who'd um, been... Um, you know, uh, work, working on our side during the Second World, Second World War, and uh, they were very case hardened towards all, all, all these uh, left wing activities. And uh, I was holding a meeting with the um, he, was, he was either the then Foreign Secretary or or Home Secretary Douglas Hurd. It was one of my speaker meetings at the Hammersmith uh, Polish uh, Centre, and um, the, the left wingers came along, you know, and gave this massive demonstration against us calling us fascists you know we were always called fascists at all, all points in time we were fascists and um, with the Socialist Workers Party came along and um, I don't know whether you, you, you probably have never had experienced this in politics but the, so- the Socialist Workers Party were really quite violent they actually, they actually would, would, uh, would want to you know, have, a, have a proper punch up but um, the, ho- the, home, the Home Secretary came along and the police sort of moved them on and we'd had our meetings and, the, and one, of the, 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 one of the chief sort of uh, immigrants uh, there uh, from the the Polish centre got hold of me and said, look, you must be a fairly sound guy here. My country has suffered um, from national socialism um, under under the Germans and it's suffered from um, international socialism under under Stalin. Um, And one of the greatest uh, campaigners against this has been a chap called Hayek. Do you know anything about him? And I said, well, no, I don't know anything about him at all. No, no idea. Who is he? And uh, this old gentleman took me off to, to a bookshop and we bought um, Dr. Amon Butler's uh, first... Uh, well, it's a really nice little book, an introduction to the thought of um, Friedrich Hayek. And at 16, I was hooked. I was absolutely hooked at that um, point in time on, on Hayek and uh, really wanted to get in and un- understand more about him because he seemed to give um, a justification for... Um, the, the, the free market system, and I knew at that point in time that I wanted to study economics. But um, I thought, you know, where shall I go? Um, being fairly assured, sure of myself, I applied for Cambridge. So I had the grades to get into Cambridge. LSE was my second choice, uh, and I, rem- I remember going, <laughs> going, going to my interview uh, at Downing College um, at Cambridge, and, and uh, the master there was a chap called Hopkins. And uh, after, my, after my interview, he said to me, Mr. Baxendale, I don't doubt your intellectual um, ability. I doubt your commitment. So I was doing other entrepreneurial things. I doubt your commitment. And you are far too arrogant, young man. Far too <laughs> arrogant to come, to, to come here. So anyway, that set me on the path of uh, LSE. So uh, <laughs> that's, that, that's how I ended up at LSE. And I, I, I'm glad I ended up at LSE, really, because that, that is... That is my spiritual home, and it was it was a, a correct that I, that Cambridge swerved me and uh, put me on the direction um, to LSE. But I, I, as I was going to LSE, I thought this would be wonderful. We'd be able to study um, Hayek and Lionel Robbins and 
and um, you know all, all the great Austrians because after all Hayek was there for 21 years Robbins must have been there for nearly 45 years but um, to, my, to my shock and horror um, I, I, I enrolled in the, in, in the economics department and there was, just, there was nothing, nothing at all it was, uh, it was all um, you know, Alice in Wonderland economics really of, uh, <laughs> of, of, of Keynes um, so I, I moved out of that department because I couldn't quite I, I couldn't get any sense there at all and uh, went, went into the government uh, department and studied philosophy, philosophy and law um, under one of Michael Oakeshott's um, protégés, Dr. Dr. Robert Orr and um, studied a British, I- British idealism of uh, Collingwood and, 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 and Oakeshott which actually has uh, a lot of similarities and parallels with, um, with, with Mises but uh, Mises wouldn't have even, even appeared on the, uh, on the Richter scale in any, in any way, shape or I- uh, form at the, at, at the LSE so uh, unfortunately um, my, the only thing I did manage to study at the LSE on Hayek was his political philosophy going forward from 1945 so you, you, you could get it was respectable enough to be able to, to uh, re- read and study the road to serfdom and the constitution of liberty but that's as far as it goes so I still had so I left, I left the LSE still with these questions in my mind as to why is Hayek called an economist you know why, why, why is he an economist I've never seen any of his works and no, no one could ever show me any of his works and, and uh, no, no one was really, really interested in, t- in teaching any of his works so I made a a mental note at that point in time to, to then um, refer back to Hayek at some later point in time. And I resumed, well, I, well, I had already resumed my entrepreneurial uh, careers and, and money-making schemes had become uh, far more uh, of, of interest to me than any, any politics or any academic studies. And really, I mean, the, the students in here, you'll, 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 you'll love what I was doing while I was, while I was a student. At age 19, I was absolutely fascinated by society it girls you know very very affluent um, I don't know what they're called in, in you know in this country but uh, very rich wealthy heiresses and I used to be fa- fa- fascinated by these beautiful ladies and I used to follow them around and uh, this is when I was 18, 19 years old and they used to go to this nightclub called the 151 Club on the King's Road in Chelsea if you know London the King's Road is a very exclusive um, very affluent area and a lot of inherited money and inherited wealth um, resides, in, resides in that area so uh, anyway managed to get into the club this is um, talk, took my way in started talking to the owners and, 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 and the owners were well w- one of the owners in particular was um, looking to retire he just had a hernia operation and uh, he, wanted, he wanted out and I thought this is too much of a good opportunity it really is an opportunity I've got to buy this place now how <laughs> now how how do you how do you buy this place when you have no money? You know, this, is a, <laughs> this is a problem. Um, but anyway, what I, what I thought, if some of you are involved in politics, you'll, you'll understand this. There, there, are, there are always a few guys who are, who are you know, probably a little bit um, so, socially inadequate, you know, a bit, um, shall we say, sexually challenged. Um, so, I thought, <laughs> so I thought to myself, well, what I'll do is I had two, two individuals who I thought, well, they're rich and wealthy. Um, I'll, go and, I'll go and approach them and, um, and, and spin the line to them that look if they got involved in this nightclub backed me so I could have a few percent my first little few percent of, of, of ownership they'd, um, they'd vastly enhance their chances with the, with the opposite sex um, if, if they became involved and that, and that was it they fell for it you know, they, <laughs> they, they, <laughs> they they fell for it and then we bought, we bought this nightclub in 19, 1989 and um, it was the start of my, um, my um, start of the LSE in fact so whilst I, I suddenly went from having absolutely nothing to, to having a, you know, a fabulous income and absolutely tremendously I'd, I'd never seen money uh, like I, I was earning so then of course you know, as soon as it was coming in it was going immediately out on fast women, fast cars, <laughs> rock and roll lifestyle and, e- and everything like that but um, it, you know it, 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 it was fun and um, <laughs> I, I have to say though if my son who's now uh, three years old ever decides to do anything like this and not, not concentrate on his studies and be a good boy and so on and so forth I, I'll take a very different line but uh, <laughs> 
Anyway, I, 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 I got to, you know, I got away with it. And we got my first little bit of ownership, and it was wonderful. I used to do my, I used to go to go to lectures, um, and then uh, go to the nightclub, have a good time doing whatever I was doing, and then a uh, little sleep, and then back into lectures, lectures again. So I had a whale of a time through through university. But um, if you remember, 19, about 1989, 90, the the recession had really started um, hitting us, and I thought, well. What, we, what I ought to do is divest. Let's be sensible. Let's try and you know, put, put some money aside here rather than spending it all on uh, fast cars and women and so on and so forth. Let's go and invest it in, 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 in the future. And I chose um, a restaurant venture in, uh, again in Chelsea in Lower Sloan Street um, called Le Casino. And it was, uh, the reason why I went for it is I thought it's got to be recession proof because it was only five pounds. Everything in there was five pounds. Everything cost five pounds for a meal. You eat anything, any, anything you wanted, and it was packed, absolutely packed. And I thought this would be a good start point here. I can't, I can't really go wrong. But um, you know, 1991 recession came in, and um, the whole, um, the whole economy just tanked in London, and things started going um, terribly wrong in the restaurant. It started becoming loss making. Uh, so I had to think of how am I going to get out of this. And um, what I used to do is I used to after the nightclub, go, oh, so before the nightclub, I go to the restaurant, then I go to the nightclub, and then I go to the markets, um, the fresh produce markets in, in, in London, of which there are three principal fresh produce markets, uh, Billingsgate for, meat, uh, for fish, Smithfield for meat, and um, Nine Elms, Covent Garden for fruit and veg. And I used to, I'd cut out our traditional suppliers and go to, go to the restaurants in my, in my own van, and go to the markets in my own van and pick up all the fresh produce. And I was saving about a thousand pounds a week for the uh, for the restaurant, which allowed it to trade uh, trade out of the 1991 recession, and then allowed me to offload it. But we we offloaded it. I well, I had two partners in there. Offloaded it for a for a loss of seventy thousand pounds, and um, I had one of those very awkward conversations with the bank, um, <laughs> aged aged twenty <laughs> aged, aged, aged twenty one, which consisted of bank manager. Why should I support this? Uh, why should I fund this seventy thousand um, uh, pounds to, 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 to get you out of trouble and sell, you know sell the restaurant? Um, you know you've got no you've got no income now. How, how are you going to pay it back? Um, perhaps I should just bankrupt you. And uh, I, I said, well, I don't think that's wise. If you bankrupt me, you know at the end of the day it's blood on your face. You'll never get any mon- any money back. So so what I what I did is I said to him, look, I'm saving a thousand pound a week for the restaurant. If I go and offer my services to other restaurants as a buyer for them, um, then you know we've got a money-making operation here. And uh, he, he, he uh, accepted that um, and agreed a five-year loan repayment period for the £70,000. I paid it off in 18 months. And we built um, you know, a, t- a £20 million turnover business on the back of it since then, supplying hotels and uh, restaurants. And life's calmed down a bit, you know, and it's all, all very... <laughs> it's all, it's all very sensible now and uh, very, very respectable and, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth. But, uh, but, uh, but anyway, that was, a, that was what I was building up, um, you know, whilst I was at university and then after university. And then um, in 1996, when uh, life did settle down and I, and I had, you know, proper management in place and so on and so forth, I thought I'd like to get back to, back to my academic uh, back to my academic interests and, and really now actually try and find out after, after nearly 10 years, you know, what, what are Hayek's economics? Because no one, no, one te- no one could tell me, no, n- no one knew. None of his books were, 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 were published or anything. And I put, he always used to refer, Hayek always used to ref, uh, refer to this chap called Mises very respectfully, very, very respectfully indeed. And I thought, well, I'll try on the internet who, who this Mises is, plugged in, plugged in Mises in 1996, and then bang, you know, I came to the Ludwig von Mises um, Institute, and um, that was just a, 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 such a great, um, an eye-opener. It was a great, uh, just clarity, it gave me such clarity of mind and thinking. And then I, then I learned, actually, about um, Austrian, um, Austrian economics, um, and um, it was, yeah, it was well. I, I haven't looked back since. It's answered. It's answered all my answered all my questions. Um, but uh, anyway, just in, in terms of in terms of some of the ob- observations, I'd like to like to share with you um, about my experiences. 
in, in, in the business world and how they relate to Austrian economics. Um, I think the, uh, the, the first, um, first thing I'd like to, like to tell you about was um, Smithfield Meat Market. Your Smithfield Meat Market is a, is a fresh produce market and, and for any of you teachers here, I strongly recommend that there will be places in the, in the United States where cattle is traded or where, where, uh, where meat products or fish products or fruit and veggies, veggies traded. We are, we, are, we are told in, in any economics um, class, you, you start with um, you know, learning about demand and supply and you can see how the market works, clears all the time, um, efficient allocation of resources and so on and so forth. And then that's a kind of week of your course and then you spend the next year learning, learning about how, how the markets are completely and utterly imperfect and they, nev they, never, they never clear, they, they never work and you know, you, you, you know the story but the, the first thing that when I, when I first went down to Smithfield Meat Market it was, it was an absolute eye opener for me because I'd sort of accepted this line of thinking and um, I, I believed in the in, in, imperfect competition type of thing and I'd been pushed down the, the sort of public choice in Chicago um, school way, way of understanding things but then to see it, uh, with the, the beauty about a fresh produce market is that um, you've got the time clicking against you uh, for, from, from, day, from day one. So as a trader, you have to clear your product on day one. So all, all, all product clears. The market, what, to, to all different buyers, the price adjusts, it clears out. They are, they are the nearest thing you're going to get to a perfect market. Now, wh why, why can it work in food production um, and not in, not in any other aspect of, uh, other aspect of business I don't know, and no one can really answer that question. There, there isn't an answer to that question. It, it works in all the free market works in all marketplaces, and the only the only the only time you'll ever see surpluses in uh, in fresh produce markets is where government is involved, such as where the, in, in in the United Kingdom we have the Common Agricultural Policy, which um, which is a, a, a European wide driven policy that subsidises production of certain type, certain fresh produce. And what a surprise! You know, there's massive oversupply, oversupply huge, great, big um, you know, beef mountains, butter mountains, grain mountains, you know, you, 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 you name it. So it's only when the government intervenes in the fresh, fresh produce marketplaces do you ever get any inefficiencies. So I, I would recommend to any, any teacher, you know, take, take your students down, you know, after they've been given, after they've been spoon fed the first year course of all, all the rubbish, actually take them to take them to these marketplaces and see, see the free market in operation. Unha unhampered, it works, it clears. You have to clear uh, your produce at all, po all points in time. So that's the first little observation that I, I, I made when I, when I went into my business career proper. The second observation um, that I made is that I don't know whether the meat market, certainly in the United Kingdom, they're, fu they're full of... Um, how should we say char the characters affable affable rogues you know <laughs> is the is the is the is the politest the politest way i can describe uh, these 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 people and um i remember i remember one of them uh, his name is jimmy i won't say his surname because i'll probably incriminate him um he used to he used to always come up to me and if you're if you're a proprietor of a business you were called governor he used to refer to you as governor so say he says to me, Hannah, come on, Governor, look, I've got loads of stuff I want to show you. And you know, take, take me to his van. And then it, you know, in his van, you'd see all this array of uh, Gucci knocked off products and oh. Versace and you know, so on and so forth. And very foolishly, one, very, I was trying to resist purchasing you know, anything off this character. <laughs> uh, really, really, I, I spent about two years trying to resist him, but he kept on pursuing me because being a polite, a polite sort of guy, I am. Um, you know, never really told him to sod off. You know, in any in any in, a, in, a, in any meaningful way. So he kept pursuing me, and in the end, struggling to buy Christmas presents for my um, for my uh, all the female members of my family, I um, bought some Chanel Number no. Five off him. And to my great um, great disappointment, um, there's a sort of on Christmas Day there was sort of strange looks at me, and my my sister was the only only one who'd. Uh, you know, being on the same level as me, so she sort of came up to me and said, you disgust me, you do. And I said, <laughs> I said, I said why? What have I done? What have I done, what have I done now? No, you disgust me. You've, you've sold them stuff that all smells like gnat piss. You know? so, so anyway, with, Jim, with Jimmy, with Jimmy you'd, think, you'd, you'd think I'd learned my lesson, but, but 
he then he then came up to me one day. He then came up to me one day, and he produced a roll of a roll of it was money, counterfeit money. He was getting involved in some you know very seriously criminal activities, and he he rolled out this whole re, ream of uh, ream of twenty pound notes and um, mm-hmm. said and, and said to me, you know, you can buy this two pound two pound or twenty pound note, Toby. You know, what do you what do you you've got to you've got to be mad not to buy this off me. I said, no, thank you, Jimmy. Not interested. <laughs> not interested at all. Anyway, a few days few days later. A few days later, there, there's uh, Jimmy laughing away, smiling. He, uh, he was so happy. It was, this was about five o'clock in the morning. He's really, really, really happy with himself. I said, oh, Jimmy, um, why are you so happy? And he said, oh, well, you, you're never, ever going to believe it. I've had real luck this morning. I was driving down the Seven Sisters Road. Now, for any of you who know uh, the Seven Sisters Road, that is a, a very, very seriously dodgy part of town <laughs> where, the, uh, where, where the professional ladies work the streets, <laughs> shall, we, shall we say. And he said, um, oh, yeah, I've, had it. I've just had such a result. I was stopped and I was asked by, asked by a girl if I, if I wanted any services. So I said yes, went over, did, did the business, gave her a £20 note and I got £10 back. And I can't... <laughs> and I can't <laughs> Yeah. And, I, and I can't believe my luck, so I've got the service and I've earned ten pounds yeah, with, with my money. I, t- I turned around to him and said, "Jimmy, are you trying to be uh, uh, the next candidate for governor of the Bank of England?" Yeah. But, he, but, but, Jim, but Jimmy, anyway, he, he didn't understand that uh, last uh, last week. Now, needless to say, in probably ten years, I haven't seen Jimmy again, so I suspect he's, he's serving time at one of Her Majesty's uh, institutions. Uh, yeah, that's, that's right, where he's probably, uh, he's probably best, um, best, uh, best kept there. But anyway, I, I mention that because I think Austrians will, uh, Austrians will un- understand that. Um, but I'm still, I, I still am slightly confused into my mind, actually. Of who, who's the bigger criminal? Is it the Jimmys of the world... Um, who, who, who's the counterfeiter? Who's ripping off the uh, the working lady? Or, or is it the governor? Is it the governor of the Bank of England who's just ripping off the, the whole population? Period. You know, I don't. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, I, I'm, you know, ev- ever since reading um, Rothbard's what, "What has government done with my money?" You know, I can't can't uh, our money. I can't really answer that question. I, um, you know, b- b- before I take the conventional view that it's the it's the it's the petty criminal, but now I'm 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 completely lost. This is a this is a, a, a major problem. But um, I mentioned the counterfeiting um, story because I think the Austrian audience will un- understand where I'm coming from there. But there's a- an interesting point of history here. I was reading um, a biography of Isaac Newton. And I don't know whether any any of you know that Isaac Newton has actually played a, a very um, important role in in, um, in sound money. He was um, master of the royal mint um, from uh, from the 90, uh, from the 1690s uh, for, for about 20 years or so, and, and he was he was made master of the master of the royal mint, um, and he was he was so concerned with the um, with the clipping of the coinage uh, that was going on um, that he agreed a deal with the crown whereby he would be paid. Uh, a little percentage of each coin to pull all the coinage in from the uh, from the uh, e- economy and remint it and get it um, get get proper value established in the coinage and during now that could be an inflationist uh, uh, dream there being paid to bring in coinage and but the the counterbalance against that was that um, he uh, underwent periodically every every few months the trial of the picks which is um, which actually still happens today. It's where it's where the um, the goldsmith company, which is a livery company of of goldsmiths, um, assess um, the the weight and integrity of the coinage. Um, and um, Newton was uh, put had, had severe financial penalties put against him if uh, if the coinage didn't come up to standard. So there was a check and a balance. And to 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 top that all, Newton also um, became a justice of the peace. So he could vigorously pursue all counterfeiters and have them executed, which was uh, the kind of, which poor, poor old Jimmy, if he was around in 1690, he wouldn't be just he wouldn't be languishing at Her Majesty's pleasure. Now he'd be uh, he, he would be executed. But that's how that's how sound money was delivered um, into in, into uh, England from 16 from 1690 onwards. And I picked out a little quote 
from a, a contemporary economist um, and, and scientist, Sir William Petty, in his book Political Arithmetic. And he said that Newton had established a, a standard measure that the whole cash of England was some six million pounds, and, and that, was, that was it, was money sufficient to drive the trade of the nation. And quite, and quite right too, you know, there's, no, there's, never, any need, there's never any need to have, have more money than that, and there, and, 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 and there never is. It's only, we, we've only uh, increased it due to all the inflationist policies. So, um, there's one thing, uh, one thing I'd, I'd just like thought you, you, you might like to know uh, about I, I, Isaac Newton and, and sound money, and he, he has a role in the sound money mo movement. Not, not, he's not only just a scientist. But I, 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 I digress anyway. <coughs> Moving back into the, into the modern period, um, some other observations uh, I, I've made is that um, it, it, was, it became clear that during the 1990s a, a Labour government or a traditional Labour government would never ever be elected again under, the, under their banner of common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange, which is what you had to sign down to if you, if you joined, joined the Labour Party. Tony Blair changed all that when he came in power in 19... 1994, and he publicly stated that um, none of the Thatcher um, reforms would ever be repealed or replaced by, replaced by his government. So, in, in a sense, he was turning the Labour Party into, into a, a Conservative Party, a, a Thatcherite party, and he got elected on the back of it in 1997, and you know, I think all the, the business community um, largely, largely welcomed it. I don't think we, we, we saw any particular problem um, with Blair if he stuck to what his election promises were. Now, Blair is the, he is the, uh, he's the, pro, you know, the real, um, he's the best actor in the world and he's, the, he's a total and utter chameleon and he's, he, he has stuck to his promises largely. Um, but what, what, what he's done and the thing that, thing that has, has affected us terribly and tragically is that he's incorporated all, all the social chapter legislation um, in from Europe into the United Kingdom law and that's a union charter really so we now, we now have and that's why the unions are silent in, in the United, United Kingdom they don't, they, don't need to, they don't need to resort to violence and intimidation uh, and their closed shop practices to, to extract uh, money out of businessmen they don't need to do that anymore um, what, what they have is they have a whole raft of legislation that's driven from Europe that now, now it gives them all, all their wishes. You can't. It's virtually impossible now to sack um, someone in the United Kingdom. Virtually, virtually impossible. We have on the back of the social chapter a 48-hour working week, which um, certainly, if you're a night worker, even if you consent to working more, want to work more, want to work overtime more, you can't do. You know, you're not allowed to. It's prohibited under the social chapter. You've got to give people minimum four weeks, four weeks holiday pay plus, plus uh, public holidays, uh, you've got to give paternity leave um, paid for two weeks, you've got to give um, 13 weeks, up to 13 weeks off to anyone who asks for unpaid paternity leave. So you can conceivably, every, every male member of your sta staff can have, have up to, uh, who, who has children, this applies to you if you, if you have, uh, if you have ch children, not just if, you're, if your mm. wife is giving birth to a child, but if you have children, period you can have paternity leave periodically and um, you can literally work for 40% you know, of the year you can be being on paid leave um, and, and the other 60% you can work if you, if you so choose uh, to, to turn up to work. <laughs> but if you do turn up to work, you know, as, as, as a boss, you've got, to, you've got to be very careful now with your staff in terms of how, in terms of how you handle things and you know, the, cost, the cost that this has put on, on our business and the, the, the lack of... Uh, flexibility that we, na we now have because you can't, it, it's just so dangerous to sack people. I've been sued, in the last year I've been sued for over £100,000 um, which has been, you know, tragic you know, for, for, for me. No, no one wants to give away that kind of money in cold blood to very, sp very spurious claims and this is, this, is the way, this is the way law is. And then on, on, on the other side of the equation, um, just, just so much as you can't um, sack people, you, it's very difficult to recruit people as well for, ma for manual labour because you've got the, your, your competition is in fact the social security system. That, that, that it, that's who you're competing against in, in, our, in our country. Um, and I have some sympathy uh, with, with the, the individuals who do this. 
if you, if you live in London, um, and let's say you know, the minimum rental you're going to pay for a one bedroom, one bedroom apartment is probably 300 pounds, 300 pounds a week. It's very, it's very expensive. If you go on the social security, your housing costs are paid. So um, for a start, that's 15,000 pounds a year worth of benefit. Then when you get your income support and, and, and various other things, and you can take a cash job in the black economy, what's the point of working? There's no, there's no, there's no, real, point in, there's no real point in working. So it's tremendously difficult to recruit um, people occasionally, uh, and thankfully, I'm very, I'm very pro-immigration um, in, 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 in one respect, because you get, for every um, ten immigrants in, you might get nine economic immigrants who are coming to benefit from the social security system, but you'll probably get one who's really genuinely hungry and wants to, wants to improve their lot. But um, I would say that out in, our, in our London operations, we probably employ 40 or 50 percent um, foreign, or certainly non non-native, um, you know, e English-speaking people, uh, and that's the uh, that's the um, that's the tragedy of, of 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 what all this legislation has um, ha has done, and and it's slowly, slowly grinding us all to a halt. We're all, you know, because you you can't respond to market market situations, and you can see in America where things are a bit a bit more flexible. You always have higher growth figures. I think four or five percent is quite a common growth. Over here, Europe is now slowing down to 1%, 2%, and, and I, I'm sure at some point in time it will go to negative growth because of the, um, the social costs um, that we all have on, 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 on top of us, which are, which are far too restrictive. And I think Britain is um, actually viewed, viewed still to be one of the better um, and more flexible economies. I think in, fr in France they, they really have it bad, where it's a 35-hour week, you are excluded from working anything over 35 hours and um, the, the, the social insurance costs off uh, on on cost of 40% onto your, onto your salary. So it's really, really, really crippling, um, crippling stuff. But this is the, uh, this is the, um, the state of the economy that we're, that we're in and, 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 and what we're experiencing uh, at, at the moment. But on, on, on a European point, now I'm, I'm in danger of getting on my high horse here. Europe, to me, is the is is the is the biggest biggest um, of all um, problems that is potentially facing our our our, um, our nation at the moment. Um, and in fact, all, all all of all of the nations of Europe, because what what it is is it's a great big socialist pro uh, project of income redistribution from the richer part richer parts of Europe to the poorer parts of Europe, and. Um, we're just about to sign a constitution, the first, the first European constitution. And I mention this point because um, uh, reading the works of uh, Thomas Di Lorenzo and uh, looking at um, the LouRockwell.com, you're, 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 you're very key on promoting um, the secession point, um, which is something I would never, not, not really studying American history or anything, it's not something I wouldn't really really focus my mind on but um, there's no there, there were, up until two months ago there were no secession provisions in, in the draft European constitution and uh, now through lots of agitation by various uh, people there is a, there is a secession point um, called, and it's in article 59 of the draft constitution and it's called voluntary uh, withdrawal from the union and I'd like to read it uh, to you point number one any member state may decide to withdraw from the European Union in accordance with its own constitutional requirements. Uh, that sounds lovely, doesn't it? That sounds, that's, that's perfect. Now, if only, if only a politician could kind of leave it there. But we, 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 we go on. Any member, any member state which decides to withdraw shall notify the European Council of its intention. The European Council should examine that notification. In the light of the guidelines provided by the European Council, the U Union shall negotiate and conclude an agreement with that state, setting out the arrangements for its withdrawal, taking account of the framework of its future relationship with the Union. Now that sort of sound, sounds all, all, all okay. They're, they're talking about negotiation. Well, you know, maybe, maybe you can give them the uh, courtesy of negotiating with them. It then goes on. That, that agreement shall be concluded on behalf of the Union by the Council of Ministers, acting by qualified majority, so they can vote. If they vote against you, you're well, kind of game over. You can't, you can't succeed. Uh, after obtaining the consent of the European Parliament. 
And then they really, really clarify what their intention is, is here. The representative of the withdrawing member states shall not participate in the Council of Ministers or European Council discussions or decisions concerning it. So you, you can, you're, allowed to, you're allowed to say you wish to leave, but then that, that's it. The, the negotiation is very, very one-sided thereafter. And, um, you know, I fear, I mean, I, I, re- I really do genuinely fear, uh, certainly within my lifetime I mean it took the in the American experience I think it's probably about 70 years from, from constitution to, 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 to civil war um, if you don't have a, a right to secede then you don't then you don't have any freedom and really that's the end of that's the end end of uh, any any, any um, independence of um, of the European uh, of the independent European states that's it it's, it, 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 it's finished and that's a that's a real a very very real possibility um that that will come, in, come into law within this calendar year. And Blair has, has said uh, that there will be no referendum um, on, on this at all as the politicians have already been empowered and mandated to act on our behalf uh, on such a, a momentous issue of, uh, of history. So we, we've already been told our, our, our masters will decide for us. And by the way, we've already decided it's we're going to be signing it. So... <laughs> You know, th- th- there we have it. The other um, point that I'd like to just um, dwell on, the Austrian, Austrian theory of the business cycle is something that's um, very, very close to my heart. A- a- as a businessman, you know, we, we, we sit in the economy and, and, and we feel the exact movements that uh, Hayek initially described in, in, hi- in his work in prices in production at the LSE in the 1930s and what Roger, uh, Roger Garrison has, has so eloquently brought up to date and, and applied to the economy um, in, in, his very, in his book uh, Time and Money is, it, it is because, because um, we, um, we live and experience the, 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 the business cycle business people have a natural affinity to the, to the, Austrian, um, to the Austrian cause but I'd like to put one, one more a uh, little footnote to the Austrian theory when um, and, and it might actually be a good research project for, for some postgraduate, postgraduate students. The Austrian theory of the business cycle describes how when the interest rate um, moves uh, and monetary inflation is, is, is initiated, um, you, the various stages of production get skewed as, uh, as people think um, there's more, um, th- th- there's more um, consumption, well, there's, a, there's an investment <coughs> overhang um, and, and a business cycle um, in, 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 in ensues. Um, this is, I don't need to go into it, um, and perhaps I won't be best uh, I- I- explaining it, but um, in, the Austrian, in the Austrian theory, when the correction comes, um, it can predict what areas of industry the correction will, will, will come in, what stages of production. Um, but um, it can actually go a stage, a stage further as well. The, the only businesses that will ever, ever be affected during the business cycle are those are those businesses, the large corporations, where you where you lend where you don't lend on asset base or, or against your asset base, where you're where you're lending on your cash flow risk, or you, when you're lending on um, mezzanine finance and so on and so forth. When the correction comes, the vast majority of small businesses um, that that uh, exist in the economy um, survive. We we survive we survive any, um, any any recession because. We don't have gear. We don't have gearings that the big corporations do because the banks won't lend us lend us any money. Anything is done; they'll only lend you against your assets. So the Austrian theory of the business cycle has a has a great advantage. And in, 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 if you look at look at the way companies are structured and and, and, and what their borrowing positions are, you can um, you can then predict actually what companies, not only what stages of production are going to be worse affected, but you can actually then predict what kind of companies are going to get blown out of the water in any, in any correctional um, period and they'll be all companies based on um, non, non-asset, based, uh, non-asset based lending so you know postgraduates uh, could you know do, do, do some research into that I think you, you, you'd be able to really um, fine tune the Austrian theory of the business cycle and make it a very good predictive, predictive tool but anyway um, Jeffrey Herbin are quite well, very, uh, he's very complimentary about me uh, in terms of what we've set up um, at the LSE now. Being inspired by uh, the Austrian school, I, we've, I've endowed a, a teaching program at the LSE with uh, the Ludwig von Mises Institute um, helping me 
here at all points in time and Roger Garrison was the first lecturer. We have Pete Beckley uh, next year who's going to be working on um, uh, the socialist calculation debate and then really I'd like to move on to a thir third year. I'd like to get into um, um, putting forward Austrian methodology and really establishing, really establishing the, the, the foundations and, 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 and the groundworks at the school. Um, <coughs> And that, that's what we're doing at the LSE. So I, I, I put my money where my mouth is. I believe, believe in the school and we'll, pro, we'll, we'll promote it actively. The other thing that we're, we're doing is um, we've established uh, the Cobden Centre as a, as a charity in the, um, in the United Kingdom. And you'll soon start seeing uh, our, our website. It's a scholarly uh, website, the Cobden, the Cobden um, Centre and we aim to produce all of Cobden's work. Now, for some of you who don't know that much about, about Richard, Richard Cobden, in, in my opinion of things, he's the, the most uh, successful of all the, uh, what you'd call a libertarian, political libertarians, or he was a, he was a liberal, a radical liberal in, 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 in the 1830s, and he, he, achieved, he achieved three big things, and um, Professor Ebling touched upon them last night. One of them was repeal of the, the Corn Laws, um, in 1846, and he he he, was, he, he managed to ach uh, achieve this. It was a food tax um, by by great political guile and cunning, because or what only um, landowners had the vote in 18, 1846, and the landowners were largely the uh, la uh, aristocracy, and uh, they owned four four fifths of the land with. Um, you know, other free other freeholders, small people are own, owning the rest. Um, from 1490, and this applies to the American. The Americans uh, took this law on as uh, law on as well, even after independence. The 40 shilling freehold principle was that um, anyone who anyone who could show that their land produced more than 40 shillings worth of income uh, had a right to a vote. It was enshrined in the 1832 Reform Act, and not many not many people knew knew about this provision. So Cobden. Um, and, uh, immediately started knocking on the doors of all these little independent freeholders and got their sons and daughters and you know anyone vaguely related to them registered um, as, as freeholders because it never said in the, in the 40 shilling freehold principle just said as long as you're a freeholder of that land now you could be a common you, you, you could own that freehold in, 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 in common uh, with other people so you got lots of uh, some people will call this gerrymandering, but he got lots of people um, um, on, on, the, on the electoral roll and managed to, managed to turn, the, uh, turn the tide of opinion um, against the aristocracy and, and repealed the Corn Laws. So he's a great, a great political um, manoeuvrer as, as well. The, 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 third, the third major achievement was um, the Chevalier, um, Cobden Chevalier Act. Um, it was a treaty establishing free trade in, in 1860 and that if you look if you look at the statistics of of, of how wealth was created you, you saw from 1800 there were uplifts modest uplifts in in um, any any measurement of wealth in uh, in western europe and then from the 1860s onwards with this free trade free trade treaty i think it went up about 200 percent in 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 20 years it's a, a, a absolutely fabulous um what his achievements were his, his um, next um, achievement was um, really he was an, well I don't know whether it's an achievement or in two minds whether it, whether it could be a failure as well he was a man of he was, a ma he was called the man of international peace and uh, what Cobden um, what Cobden did was he, he, he'd established a, the, the, instead of going to war uh, and killing each other it, it, would, it would be probably nicer to, to, to have a conversation about things and he set up the principles of arbitration um, which was a, which was a great move uh, move forward because at the time the, uh, the then liberal um, foreign secretary and then prime minister Lord Palmerston um, was instituting a policy rather like Donald Rumsfeld does now gunboat diplomacy it was called gunboat diplomacy in uh, in, in, in uh, the British Empire and I think in the American Empire we should call it stealth bomber diplomacy which was <laughs> which is where whereby in, if, if if anyone touched the Touched the hair or, or, or an asset of an Englishman, uh, would send the navy in and just blow, blow up the country. And that happened in the Don Pacifico affair, where a, a Greek British Jew um, had his house burnt down by some irate Turks, and Palmerston sent in the gunboats and 
you know, invaded Turkey. Uh, and this is, um, but Co- Cobden stood vociferously uh, against this at, at, at all points in time. Um, so we're setting up the Cobden Centre to really revitalise all this work. And I, kn- I know that uh, Hayek was a great fan of Cobden, Rothbard was, um, Mises was, Manchester liberalism was something that was close, close to their heart. And I, I know Ralph Rako over there was, had the uh, Cobden Society as well, I think, with uh, George Reisman and um, with Rothbard and various, various others. Um, and uh, I think they then, you, you then called it the Bastiat Society after that. I don't know. There's probably the story as to why you went from British to French allegiance. I don't quite know, <laughs> quite, quite know what it is. Um, but uh, that's what we're doing. And then the, the other interesting thing, and the thing, thing I'll finish on, is if you... I'm a great believer in you, you practice what you, what you preach, and the Austrian um, monetary theory or is, is, is another I- an important way of, uh, of, um, of actually now making money, um, which is we have um, interest in a, in a fund called the Alternative Investment Fund, which is, which is a fund, a hedge fund based in the Cayman Islands, which is dedicated in, entirely to, to um, uh, exploiting the works of principally Mises uh, and his initial definition of the money supply and now developed uh, by Frank Shostak and published in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics. We have, we have a very accurate working definition of the money, money supply and um, with that definition in place and various economic mod- modelling we can track um, the various different changes in the purchasing powers of, of, of currencies and um, you know, it's, it's in- incredibly lucrative um, using Austrian, applied Austrian theory to, to uh, money making activities and um, I'm going to be donating 5% of my proceeds to the Mises Institute going forward on all our foreign exchange um, transactions of benefiting from the, from the, the work of uh, um, Mises and Shostak and applied Austrian theory. We're then going to be looking at um, the Mises and Rothbard um, natural interest rate theory and how it applies to credit um, spreads and uh, looking at uh, exploiting any arbitrage opportunities there. So, you know, on the, on the back of my uh, interests in, in Austrian economics, we've now got uh, you know, some, some, some very interesting, interesting businesses. Um, and I've got to say, um, my, my introduction to Austrian economics, although I was, try- I was trying desperately to find Austrian economics, I, I owe it really to Lou Rockwell over there. And he's my, he's my inspiration in terms of setting up the Cobden Institute. And we all shameless, shamelessly copy everything he's done over at the Mises <laughs> Institute. <laughs> As we will with his uh, online publication, we're, we're producing a, a publication called The Liberal and it will be, again, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll copy Lou at lou, lourockwell.com. Um, but anyway, that's, uh, that's my little story. I hope it's been of some interest to you. Uh, thank you very much. Well, well, how, how much time do you do you have? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my my heart is uh, is pumping violently now, even thinking of the man. And, uh, you know, I, w- I was faced with a choice about a year ago to, to I- either I-, I was thinking to myself either I, I should have a whip round against uh, with, with other fellow businessmen and should we ra- raise a fund to terminate him or, 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 or shall I calm myself down a bit and, and, and try, and, try and oppose him in other ways what, uh, what, what Roderick is uh, re- referring to I believe is the, is the implementation of the congestion charge this Ken Livingstone who is the Mayor, Mayor of London has hailed this as a, as a great Friedmanite uh, policy of uh, charging for uh, road use and, um, but of course, it's you know to, to, to me, I, I'd, I'd be very supportive <coughs> of paying paying for my own road use uh, if I got my taxes back. You know, then then I, I, I the, pro- the pro- problem is uh, problem is I don't want to pay for it. I pay for it once through the road tax. I pay through it twice. Then second time round through through our, our tax on on diesel, which is at 85% of the value of the diesel. And now we pay 
yeah, 85%. Now we, now we pay again through, through congestion charge, which is a five pound charge to come into the central London, central London area. Now, we in our, in our ignorance, and I should have thought this through even more, believe that the five pound charge would not actually, everyone would just pay it because you know, after all it's, it's, only, it's only five pounds. So there wouldn't be any, there'd only be a cost implication on the charging side. There wouldn't be an actual loss of revenue on the demand side for our products. So the, the cost of the charge is um, for our 45 vehicles um, going in and out of London, I think we, our, the cost of our charge is about £5,000 a month. Now that, okay, you know, you can, you can live with on the level of um, volume of, uh, of, of business that we do um, and, you know, you economise elsewhere. You can, we, we, can, we can work with that. But what, what the, the, the terrible thing has, bit, has been, and he will hail this as a, as a great... Uh, achievement is that 25% less people come into London um, as, a, as a result of that uh, uh, of the charging and and why, why they do that is because it's um, it's a very difficult thing to actually pay you have to it's not like here where you have I think you have those easy passes and you can just stick one in your car and you go down a toll roll and then it bills you at the end of the month you have to phone up um, a call centre and you can imagine it's a typically inefficient call centre and you have to then rem give them your credit card number and remember your number plate and uh, make sure you do it all between certain hours and if you do it outside those certain hours there's no, you know, that's just tough luck. Uh, if you don't pay, you, you automatically get a, a £40 fine that on day two goes to £80 and then on day three they're entitled to confiscate your car um, <laughs> with no... With no right, of, no right of appeal, so so it's absolutely lethal. So, so people people don't come in; they, they don't go into London, and, and that's where, on the London side of my business, we, we were probably doing about ten million pounds worth of sales into London. They went down to seven and a half million pounds. So, so at a 30, 30 odd percent gross margin, that revenue's just gone, and that's the bigger that's the bigger problem is is, is the loss of revenue, uh, and, and it, the politician can just do that in, in cold blood, and. Um, you know, if if, uh, if a politician decides to build an, an, an airline, um, you know, and wants to knock down a few houses and you know position it somewhere in London, there's a, there's a whole sort of inquiry about things, and people are given compensation when their land is compulsory purchased. You know, I, I feel that 25% of my my London business has been compulsory purchased, and I've got no compensation for it. But, but you know, fortunately for us, we're we're in a we're in a reasonably a strong position whereby we can expand our supply outside our traditional traditional areas. Um, but the shopkeeper, you know, if you're a barber shop or something, what can you do? You've, you've lost 25% of your customer base, and it's not. If you think in a recession, people get blown out when when three percent of the uh, you know the economy tanks, you know. But but 25%, 25%, and the, the uh, and, and this is done by a socialist. Uh, who, who cares for people and uh, <laughs> you know <laughs> and, and that, 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 that's the irony of it all so, so the only thing that we've done is we've sacked people uh, and then we've got sued for sacking people well you know I can't I've got to sack them because I you know if, if we, we won't have the money to pay for them if, 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 if we don't readjust our readjust our overhead so so whatever way you skin it you're damned you know uh, but, but of course we're, we're, we're the nasty nasty capitalist businessmen so uh you know, as far as they're concerned, we can just pick up the tab for, for, for everything. So, sorry, that's the answer to that question. <laughs> dangerous, dangerous question, that one. Oh, look. Yeah. Thank you. We finished on time. Yeah.